Okay, I, I just gave a long harangue here, realizing that it wasn't being recorded. Uh, so I'm going to have to back up and kind of um, rephrase it going forward. This is the introductory lecture to the body, uh, introduction to the body in literature and film. And it's also going to double as, uh, as an introduction to your first prompt. <clears throat> so you will have a prompt each week. This will be the first one, uh, 300 to 500 words. The quality of a prompt is dictated more by engagement than by whether you're right or wrong or, or whether you guessed what it is I expected you to say. So I call, that's why I call them prompts. They're not assignments. They're not essay questions. 300 to 500 words isn't an essay anyway. They're prompting you to engage. Think of it that way. And if you're engaging the prompt, you're you are in, in the right area to perform well. The accumulation of all your prompts is 20 or 30%, I forget, whatever's on the syllabus. And basically this, but there's only sort of three grades. If you don't post anything, I obviously, I can't give you a point. If you post anything, I can pretty much give you a point. And if it, and if it shows at least a reasonable level of engagement, I, I, you can get two points. So that's where the TAs will help. All 120. There's 122 of you guys. This class has exploded like so many of my classes. And I'm faced with the paradox that one reason these classes explode is people hear about the class and then they want to take the class. And then the numbers of students that come in begin to threaten the, the way I teach the class. And, and, and so I'm, I, I try and figure out how can I give this, this influx of students. You guys are at 125, I think now the experience that they came for, even though their own numbers threaten. <laughs> so I, I, I will insist on the prompts. I don't, I can't re put replies on 120 of them. I will, I do, I go through them and comment on a lot of them. And, uh, and often I, kind of, I try and comment on them in a way that is related to all the other ones that I'm seeing. So it's always a good idea to, to read my comments and read other people's stuff, certainly, but also my comments on other people's stuff, because you'll, you'll see reiterations of things I might have or could have um, said about yours. And then and I'll bring that into the lecture, uh, both the tape lecture and the online class. The tape lectures will I try, try and keep under an hour um, for, for each week. And then there's an on class on, on uh, Tuesday evening. Um, and that's live and that's synchronous, but it's also taped. So you can watch it even if you're not unable to attend. So I encourage you to attend because that's what gives it the live discussion format and in the chat and, and, and in elsewhere. Because it's not, it's not just another lecture, it's a, it's, a, it's a discussion. I may get into lecture mode at times, but it's intended to actually be talking about um, things. So uh, please, so try and attend. If you can't attend every week, that's fine. If you only attend a half hour um, at the beginning or at the end, it, that's fine. This is a drop in. It's not really. It's not rude necessarily to 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 drop in and drop out, say a few things and and leave, and maybe watch the the rest later. I, I mean, the format of this we're in a physical place, which nothing is anymore. Um, is it would just be an open office hour with multiple students coming and going saying thanks a lot I gotta go I got calculus in 10 minutes and it's like oh great thanks for dropping by so that's that's the atmosphere um and uh <clears throat> so we'll be talking about the body and uh this this first assignment is for you to find a cover of Cosmopolitan magazine and a cover of Playboy magazine and a comment on the relationship, and I'll say a few things about this in a moment, between discourse and what I'm calling the cultural legibility of the body. Because it's interesting that in these magazine covers, um, you know, it's never the case that this happens to be Taylor Swift, uh, but it, it's never the case that you just have a woman and say cosmopolitan, and here's a picture of Taylor Swift. What's what you really get is a body that's inscribed by discourse, which is what why this is, can be so instructive. Uh, obviously, Taylor Swift is legible. You can take a photo of Taylor Swift, and even if you've never heard of Taylor Swift and you don't recognize 
her at here. You'd still say, well, that's a woman. Or you could say that's Taylor Swift. And you could go on and say, I, I like her music. I don't like her music. My favorite song is um, I saw her on Saturday Night Live, whatever. And, and you can go to, to more discursive. If she's a supermodel, uh, or perhaps even an, at this point an unknown model, then there will be less uh, context, and you'll see the woman as as presented. We'll we'll get into later issues of photoshopping and airbrushing and so on, because how does that affect cultural legibility? And that's been a that's been much more the case um, in the last 20, 30 years. There's always been incredibly careful lighting. If you look at the Hollywood glamour photos of the 40s, but there they were, and there was airbrushing to a degree, um, but not the capacity to manipulate and alter that at the level of the pixel, um, which can not only narrow hips and, and uh, colorate skin um, and widen eyes, um, and you know, on it, it's, it's virtually unlimited what you can do with, it with when an image is, re is related to pixelation. Um, but that aside for the moment, this in this particular prompt, we're particularly interested in what is the relationship between discourse and the body? Because here's the, the presumption here is you're born with what might be uh, labeled uh, male anatomy or female anatomy. And we know how important that is from the beginning. So not only, we not only have the sonograms that people pass around, it's a boy, it's a girl. Lately, we've had these gender reveals, which are, you set off fireworks that are blue or fireworks that are pink or whatever ways you might construe this. And, and it's, it's, it's seen as an originary moment, like it's a girl. Um, but in fact, it's still a female, it's a female body and then it's a male body. And then the gender reveals this, it's a boy and it's a girl. That's already a, a, a step into discourse that a male body is a boy, that a female body is a girl. It's already, that's already imposed for better, for worse. And, and we're increasingly aware of that as we move through the LGBTQ community through and, and through transgender and, and issues that are, uh, that there's, there is a kind of cultural challenge these days to the relationship between discourse and the body. I'm not sure it's always as effective as it wants to be. And we'll, we'll talk about that, but even something like a gay pride parade, when you look, when you hear from people who are either frankly homophobic or, or inclined that way, they will say to, like more mild forms of like, well, okay, fine, they're gay. Why do they have to have a parade? Well, they have to have a parade because they're culturally unintelligible and have been for years. So you, They've been in the closet from, from the 40s and 50s. Um, and so, you know, we're here and we're queer and, and these placards that are being carried have a very, uh, it, it, they, have a, they have a real purpose um, saying that we are called, we, we demand to be culturally intelligible in a way that has not been allowed by the regulatory schemas of what a man is and what a woman is. Um, regulatory schemas that are essentially in operation in, in this in this cover of Cosmopolitan and in Playboy magazine, uh, which is anachronistic now. I realize it's hardly magazines at all. I mean, Cosmopolitan's even getting anachronistic. But I, I'm going to Dora the, the hysterical case of this, uh, hysterical analysis, which is also part of our first reading. It's 120 years old. That should be anachronistic too. Um, but in fact. And I do want you to try and read the Dora piece that, that's some part of this prompt. Um, and we'll be talking about it on Tuesday. Uh, Dora's an 18 year old girl who's brought to Freud by her father. He famously says, make her see reason. Uh, and in fact, what he's really asking for it to do is persuade Dora to conform to a position that's been constructed for her so that a, a quote unquote perverse relation, familial structure can continue as if normal. We'll be talking a lot about the relationship of normal to perverse, because to some degree, normality is only definable in relation to per the perversions that are set uh, up as a, as a challenge to it. And, and a lot of normative structures um, can have very uh, de deleterious effects on the body, so that so many familiar, so many physical ailments like anorexia nervosa that, that have a mental component are protests against 
positions in familial structures. And it seems particularly true of, uh, of hysteria. Plato insisted hysteria was, was a woman's ailment, that hista, the, that the womb was traveling around, causing pressing against the lungs, pressing against the heart, and so on, and causing all of the myriad physical ailments that, that had no biological basis. Um, but what we understand much better now is that once the body is translated through discourse um, and a regulatory schema into a performance of gender, which is in relation to power, and that power is an effect of relationship, uh, which brings in the masculine and makes femininity and masculinity mutually constituted. Once, once all of that has occurred, you, you have a culturally intelligible body that's significantly um, castrated, cut off uh, in one form or another from the lived and experienced body. So symptomatology of hysteria and OCD and depression and anorexia and cutting a much more, it's a lot more attention lately. We'll talk some about that. Um, cutting, just to just jump to it quickly on a, on a, on a very uh, initial level um, it is an attempt through the administration of, uh, of a defined pain that, that you have a body that, that it persists and exists before and outside and beyond the discourse that is causing you so much pain. So we'll, in one of the movies where we'll be seeing called 13, um, there's a young 13 year old girl who, we see, who is seen in, in one scene of going into the bathroom to cut shortly after her mother who struggles with alcoholism has allowed back in uh, a heavily drinking boyfriend and, and uh, part of, and it, it, it's, it sets up a combination of a, a, a relationship between Dora from 1900 and, and this teenage girl in California, I think the movie was 2003, um, her horror that, that the position she's been asked to occupy before, to, to look the other way, to not see the abusive boyfriend, to, to fend off the unwelcome attentions of the abusive boyfriend, now, all of this stuff. Um, sends her to the bathroom to to cut herself so she can feel physical pain and and a desperate attempt to to access that part of her which is is and should be unavailable to uh to the, the social regimes that are being imposed on her and we'll see this with dora too whose father is having an affair with a married woman and the husband of that married woman is increasingly demanding sexual attention from dora in a manner that's never discussed as, as if she were a consolation prize, as if the father, I don't think he even thought this, but it's as if the father uh, had said, yeah, I'm having an affair with your wife and it'd be best if you just would um, get lost. Um, but there's, my daughter's available to go for a walk with you. Um, and somehow I expect her to stay innocent. And I expect you to stay gentlemanly, but whatever. Meanwhile, it gives me unfettered access to your wife. Um, and Dora, both like any daughter, and this begins at least by the age of 13 or 14, wants to please her father. Um, and he's pleased when she takes care of the, the kids of the woman he's having the affair with, or even when he, she distracts the attention of the inconvenient husband. So like any daughter, um, there's, there's, there's a certain degree of pleasure and satisfaction and accomplishment from doing what my father wants. But of course, as, as Dora goes through puberty and through, through kind of increasing awareness of her own sexuality and the sexuality of those around her, she starts to feel betrayed, fairly enough. She starts to feel positioned, used, exploited, uh, ignored. Um, and her symptomatology, uh, fainting, persistent cough, leaving a note saying she can't go on. These are all attempts to, to take down this house of cards that, that has essentially overwritten her body with directives of how she's culturally intelligible. And, and that to the degree that she doesn't correspond to this, she is unintelligible. So symptoms by definition are unintelligible. They don't speak, we can't speak a symptom. If you can speak a symptom, it's not a symptom. But it's the persistence of symptoms, whether they're headaches uh, or coughs uh, or fainting or migraines or so on, um, is, is a persistence of the pre-discursive and, and, and an implicit, implicit protest against 
the, the constricted, contained, culturally legible body um, that is that, that is experienced as um, imp well as imposed. Uh, we'll be looking at Sylvia some of Sylvia Plath's journal entries, plus her poem in Plaster for on, the, on this coming Tuesday, and it you know it's a cookie cutter model in a way like you the the pain of somebody imposing the cookie cutter of woman or feminine or masculine, we'll talk about that too. And, and getting the outline, you know, like when you look at a cookie tray, it's, it's undifferentiated cookie dough. And then and then you take your cookie cutters and and you have a Christmas tree and you, maybe you all did this and then it's a lot of fun. Um, but what you, if you've done this, you know, you know that after you've cut like uh, quite a few figures out of the cookie dough, you take the cookie dough and you roll it up again and you flatten it out again. So you take all of the bits of cookie that didn't, that had to be cut out in order for the shapes to emerge. This is the cultural intelligibility of the body. Why does the cookie look like a tr Christmas tree? Not because it is a Christmas tree or that it, or that as a cookie it formed as a Christmas tree. You, there was a discursive imposition of the cookie cutter on the on the undifferentiated dough that's in that sense is taylor swift is who is, is is a cookie cutter uh uh outline and the cookie cutter in this case is is language um and to give you one example we you have in the lower this isn't a great copy but I'll, I'll, maybe it'll be better when i post it in your in your prompt but right here is one of the articles if you will so you ate a cupcake, uh, fast moves to burn it off. Every one of those words is an imperative, is a directive, is a cookie cutter. Um, not literally in the sense of burn it off so that you know the, the outline of your hips are not wider as a result of this cupcake. Um, but also what a funny way to think of all the other ways to say that, you know, so if you eat a cupcake or did you eat a cupcake or um, do you, would you like to lose weight, which is technically what this seems to be saying, but it's, it's how it's being said is always what's most important, not, not supposedly what, and is there something playful about it? Like, oh, you, you naughty girl, you ate a cupcake. Don't worry. We'll correct that. We'll fix that. And, uh, Cosmopolitan magazine is full of correctives of ways to fix things. Playboy magazine, you'll notice perhaps, depending on what cover you pick, is very much about um, finding the courage to express who you already are, with, and a lot of that in relation to women. Um, the fact that Playboy magazine has a has a playmate of the month is is a loaded concept, and and the the confines of the of the fold out, the center fold, the, in once in like Cosmopolitan, the women in a Playboy centerfold are substitutable and replaceable. Uh, they're all in the same fold out. They're in the same uh, um, structure of, of, the, uh, of the frame. Um, but unlike cosmopolitan covers, the playmate, there's no words there. There's, there's only context, a, a bed, pillows, maybe something in the background. Um, and the, 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 because the woman is being offered as a playmate, and it's to the gaze of the man, and that becomes a very different uh, issue. Also, the, there's the implication, you know, way before the age of Tinder, that women are substitutable. This is playmate of the month. Swipe left, swipe right. Bring in Miss August, swipe out Miss September. So we tend to think that something like Tinder is a new invention, which it is. But what interests me at the level of the discursive is, is how is Tinder also the same old thing? I'm always interested in the way the technology, whether it's photography and, and a centerfold or, or Tinder and a social platform, uh, they, they didn't just happen that way. And, and since Marshall McLuhan is right as usual, the, the medium is the message. The, the, me, the way that Tinder is constructed is what Tinder means, not anything that, that Tinder says or, or the Playboy magazine says. Um, and uh, so I could say more about this, but I, I, I think I'll bring this to a close, not least of all, because this is the second time going through it uh, while I record <laughs> her. Um, let me um, 
mentioned too that when we are in the on class setting uh make free use of the chat you can in, you can interrupt me verbally and i encourage that um but also you can ask questions in the chat i keep the chat open when i'm talking during the open class and i will interrupt myself to read things you put in the chat uh in addition to your being encouraged to interrupt me as students often say like i'm sorry professor Lynn, i didn't want to interrupt you and my point is usually how else could you get a word in edgewise uh, uh that's you know any if you don't stop me i keep going but i like i don't i like being stopped if you will i like as someone saying yeah but or or whatever you want um so please do uh, interrupt uh it, it'll, it won't in the end it won't be an interruption it'll be a redirection and a re-articulation and you will have given me the the grounds to do that and, and it, so it would be an improvement for for everyone in, including me uh as getting articulating these these dynamics as uh effectively as as possible um so uh all right so look for the prompt i'll put it under the discussion tab i'll have some of the information i've put in here um but you you really have enough to go on because what I what I what I'm really asking is what is the relationship between words and the emergence of the body as culturally intelligible and if you have time and interest and you may and this is we're going to spend the whole class on this so don't worry about it these questions kind of lead one to the other because once you've addressed that question uh what are what, what are the for want of a better word what are the pros and cons that the body has emerged as culturally intelligible in this way. What's what's seductive about cultural intelligibility is it, is it gets quickly naturalized as as the way to get things done and as the way to be. And and you'll see that both for the men and for the women, um, things as obvious as how do you get a date or or how would you get someone to go to bed with you. This these are all these all revolve around cultural intelligibility. How do you become intelligible? in in that uh way and and how do they become intelligible for you so there's lots of quizzes in cosmopolitan what 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 your man's driving habits tell you about him and you know 10 places he wants to be touched i don't know what those could possibly be uh and and the but won't tell you and it's like yeah we won't tell you because we don't know what you're talking about but th th that's the sense that it can be mapped out and the male body can be mapped out that the performance of femininity can be improved in fact there was a 1950s um cologne ad that um what I'll, I'll end on these two points there's a cologne ad that, that i could take as a model for this class which is want him to be more of a man try being more of a woman now that would pretty much come across as sexist now but but only because it's so clear i, I, don't, I don't think it's changed um and they hold the, the the particularly something like Cosmo this this constant or, or shows like Sex in the City well that's already pretty dated that that unfortunate reboot made that clear if if it wasn't already clear um, but uh, a lot of what we might call dating sitcoms you know are are something else we can look at because um, they're really they literally present gender performance even even a famous sitcom like friends or in a rather different way seinfeld um <clears throat> where, where the predatory exploitive nature of relationship is much more uh, foregrounded than it is in, in a show like friends which may have a lot to say about the era that that those two shows were were excuse me were, were coming through uh so that's that's your first prompt that's your introduction start reading dora I've, i haven't posted the, the plast journal entries or the poem in plaster yet but i will all of that will be coming together on this coming tuesday and a word to those who may not have had me before you know I, early classes my early classes uh, I often students report this isn't just my speculation can be overwhelming because so much seems to be brought up immediately and and they would agree that's true but it's because i'm dealing with mobiles uh i don't know if you know alexander calder he's a great artist who does mobiles and the thing about mobiles is if if you want to understand 
the purpose of a little piece out here on the mobile, you're going to want to bear in mind this larger piece in the mobile down here because it, it, it's it ultimately it's all of that and the body is like a, a calder mobile in fact i'll think i'll put an image of that in your prompt um what allows it to come back into it's like a body and and calder even uses bodies in uh in in naming some of his mobiles is it something happens like somebody calls you or kisses you or insults you uh and the mobile, your mobile just goes off in, in all these directions. And they're very unique. And Dora is part of a mobile. Her family is a mobile. The, Dora's experience of herself is a, is a mobile with mobility. And why is, a, why is your mobile designed that way? Because everybody is a mobile. It's, and, and, and none of them are the same mobile, but all of them claim to be a body. I'll just end on that point. I'm going to stop my recording and uh, I will post this uh, to, to Quirkus and I'll see you guys, whatever that means these days, uh, Tuesday evening. Thanks.